Episode 663. Book talk begins at 13 minutes and 45 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 663, Mildred and Lacey. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our fabulous patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and members at our YouTube channel, Craftlet Channel. This week, we would like to highlight Tara Saha, Tony with an I, Amy Bancroft, Tess, and Yvonne Ellsworth. Thank you all so much. We could not do this without you. Well, hello. How are you? I was much better until I had breakfast this morning, and now I'm back to where I was with not so much being able to eat. So that stinks. But on the upside, Andrew and I were actually able to go out to a concert, which was great. It was an outdoor concert Saturday night. We knew that rain was allegedly going to start at some point. But it was a picnic concert outdoors, and I just said, darn it, I can go do that. I can go sit somewhere where it's outdoors, and people aren't all crowded around me, and I don't have to feel claustrophobic, and however loud it's going to be, it's going to be less loud than it would be indoors. And so we went, and it was the the Riverside Symphonic thing, Symphonia, the Riverside Symphonia up at Tinicum Park here off the Delaware River in Pennsylvania. And it was enormous. I mean, I mean, it's no Coachella, thank God, but it was huge. And there were people with tables that had candelabra on them and other people who came very well prepared with tents and, you know, cabana tent things. It was lovely. Andrew was amazing and got a picnic together. So we we slept in, we had our little beach chairs and it was their 4th of July music. So it started with Fanfare for the Common Man. You can't go wrong with Aaron Copeland. And then I think they started the Rogers and Hammerstein, although really it's just Hammerstein because he was a local boy. Everybody here knew Mr. Hammerstein at some point if they've been here for long enough. And they started doing a medley of Hammerstein songs. And I think we got into the third out of probably six songs and the rain started. I was in the middle of painting Tracy's postcard for the week and I got a blop and then I got another blop and I was like, and they're watercolors, but they're not that kind of watercolors. So I stuffed those in my bag and we we did just pack up and leave. But I didn't think that was going to happen. But it was lovely while it lasted, and it means that I didn't overdo, I thought. The other thing that happened is Mildred now has a table, and I have pictures of said treadle table to share. The the new treadle table came with a Singer 66, which is a machine that could be treadle, hand crank, or motor. It did come with its original motor and light, and, and I'm looking at this wiring thinking, there is no way I am plugging this sucker in. The motor might be just fine. The light might be just fine. I'm going to be taking it to the local hardware store that is full of old men who know things. And I will be talking to them <laughs> about what my actual options are. In the meantime, though, I found that it's it's actually very hard to date the treadle cabinets, the wooden wrought iron part. And that could be a problem because I can't tell if this treadle base, the metal part, and the treadle table, the wooden part, were actually made for each other. It's kind of iffy. As soon as I I got the the treadle belt on, which is fine, that part is easy. It's remarkably easy. The Singer people are still making the same, same parts and it 
works real well, has for a long, 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 long time. But it was thwacking funny. And I found that the, what's it called? The cradle that the machine folds down into, it was not sitting right. And I found that there were some screws missing and they didn't seem to line up properly. So I faked it for now just to make sure that the treadle could treadle and it can. So I just have a little more fine tuning to do. But Mildred is coming along beautifully. I took the old 66 red eye out and put the 27 that I'd finished refurbishing in. I found I found out afterwards that there were a couple of eccentric bolts that I should not have touched and a couple of tensioners on the rocker arm, one of which I needed to have left in place because that would have given me a guideline as to the proper setting. The last known setting that worked would have been if I had left it, <clears throat> which I didn't. But I cleaned everything. So paraffin wax or kerosene is really, really good at cutting through a lot of grime, not on the black lacquered parts, which they call japanned, like we've come across in previous books. This was popular at the time. Japanning things was popular at the time. It's that very, very black, black lacquer, or in this case, black paint and shellac with decals in between. It turns out that black is really black, black, and it's hard to find a suitable repro for that. A lot of these guys who, who refurbish singers, like beyond craziness, have created their own black paint, basically, to get the right depth of black, because everything is coming up, I guess, a little gray or a little red or a little blue, which makes sense. So yeah, the things I'm learning, I tell you what. So yeah, that's the Mildred update. If anybody knows anything on how to date the cabinetry, <clears throat> not even the, the wrought iron, I'm pretty sure the wrought iron is just fine no matter what tabletop you put on it. But if anybody knows anything about dating the, the wood or, or even just getting style numbers, I am having a very hard time. It's easy to date a sewing machine, a Singer sewing machine, because they were all serial numbered. Ooh, and I am going to put on screen here a screenshot that I took, but I'll, I'll also put it into the show notes as well. Or these old machines, their serial numbers start with a letter. And depending on the letter, that can tell you one of several different things. But for the older machines, it can tell you where your machine was built because there were a finite number of Singer manufacturing plants. And the 27 that Aiden found me was made in Scotland. So that just, that just made me so happy because my, the part of my family that had the Singer featherweight that I learned on came from Scotland. So even though this machine didn't get passed down to me from my great grandmother, I kind of feel like kismet, karma, beshert. It was meant to be that this, this machine was coming to me one way or another from Scotland. It just made me very happy. But I called this episode Mildred and Lacey because as I was looking for information on dating treadles and, and things like that, I was fed by the YouTube algorithm video about the last mechanized, and by mechanized, I mean punched cardboard card jacquard loom style, a lace manufacturing place in England. And it's very sad. It was clearly an enormous workshop and one of many. And now really all they do is make lace for couture runs, which is fine. But when this factory closes, that will be it. As they said, there's no way to regain and re-ramp up production. And I think the, the guy who's been doing the punch cards has been doing it for like 40 years. 50 years. It's been a while. And he's tried to teach people how to do it. The punch machine is kind of like a, on one hand, it looks a little bit like a punch button accordion. It's called the tab, the tab buttons, not, not just the keyboard part of the accordion, but the, the little punch buttons. I don't know enough about accordions. I have to ask my sister, but 
he's doing that with one hand and then he's doing other things with the other hand and then he's doing different things with his feet and legs in order to make the punch cards. And the punch cards get sewn together or corded together and they get run through a machine just like old school punch cards did for early computers. That's where the computers came from, was from these jacquard weaving machines. Well, this is a jacquard lace making machine. It's all knotted. And it was really cool because they said it doesn't matter where you cut their lace fabric, it will only unravel to the next knot. It is not going to just fray and fall apart on you, which is cool. And just, you know, we have so many lace makers and, and people over here at Craftlet who do these things. I thought, I thought you'd probably want to take a look at this video as well. It also made me think there's a lot of talk I'm hearing from Aaron and Aiden and their friends about their keen awareness of information knowledge that is going to be lost. And I don't think it would be hard right now to find some Gen Zers who would be more than happy to learn the lace trade, at least just to keep this place going, if they could be in a, an apprenticeship program where they were able to make money. The hard thing is we would have to start buying lace, more lace than we do right now, or the couture houses would have to do more with it. But yeah, some of the lace was just extraordinary. This is the house, the lace house that did some of the lace on Kate Middleton's wedding dress. So, you know, slackers. But that that is a, a video that we'll have a link out to in the show notes for you as well. Don't forget Christmas in July. It is now July. I am recording this on July 1st. That means number one, we have a raffle winner and that raffle winner is Teresa. Teresa T, I have already emailed you. You should already know that you have won the fabulous author clock. And as soon as you send me your address, I will send you a clock. We have a July raffle and this month we're going to do the last two sets. So there'll be two winners, the last two sets of Susan's beautiful coasters and bookmarks that she made for Craftlet people. So these are the ones that have the Jane Austen text stitched into them, which is just adorable. So that's our July raffle. We have, again, two of those sets, so two winners. And Christmas in July for the bookmark exchange. Signups are now open. The link to that will be in the show notes again. You can sign up between now and July 19th and start making whatever you want to make early if you want. Otherwise, Tracy will get the name of your sendee who you're going to send a bookmark to. She'll get you that information right after the 19th. And then that will come along with any information people add, like these are the kinds of books I like, or these are the colors I like, or whatever might be useful to you. So you may want to start a bookmark earlier, but you may also want to make general plans and then finish it later. Sending August 9th for both international and domestic. Since it's not Christmas time, we don't really have a deadline deadline, but try and mail by August 9th. And that will be our uh, bookmark exchange for the summer. So excited. I'm so glad we're doing that again. I have new ideas for bookmarks. So today we are going to do three chapters in Emma. That'll be chapters 29, 30, and 31, or volume two, chapters 11, 12, and 13. And none of them are very heavy as far as like needing to preload information. So I'm just going to go quickly through that. We'll have more to talk about on the flip side, as is often true anytime we do Jane Austen. But the first is there's kind of an archaic usage of the word heavy. It must be a very heavy set that does not ask for more, a very dull group of people. That's all it, all it means. Heavy in that kind of couch potato e way, actually. There is going to be a discussion about people at a dance party, and they're trying to figure out the size of a room that would be needed to accommodate a certain number of people. And so it says there's a lot of speculation in what possible manner they could be disposed of, and that is accommodated, how, how many people could fit in the room. So it's kind of, again, an archaic usage, at least for me. It made me go, wait, what? I love Mr. Woodhouse. 
he's going to go off at one point early on in the the chapter, the first chapter today, and he's going to talk about somebody who's being thoughtless is not quite the thing. And he keeps repeating that, not quite the thing, which is like human version or a, a more personified version of that's just not done. That is not a done thing. We don't behave that way. So that's that's all that is. And it's it's kind of adorable, actually. Measles. We've talked about measles before. Measles, super highly contagious. And just again, to drive the point home, when COVID first started, we were told that the factor by which the virus was being transmitted was, I think, 2.7. So what that meant was if you got COVID and you were shedding the virus, you were infectious. Before you got symptoms, you could infect an average of 2.7 people. The amount of time that went on between getting the virus, getting enough of it in your system, cooking enough of it in your system that you were shedding it and infectious, and getting symptoms was enough days, two or three days, so that you wouldn't know. And you would just be walking around infecting other people. That's how we wound up with super spreaders and everything. Well, with measles, the average number of people that one could infect and apparently still can before you get symptoms, before you know you are sick, and definitely before you know you are sick with measles, is 15. This is why measles vaccines are super important because it can spread real super fast. And what I didn't know about measles is that not all measles was, and probably still is, but definitely was, because that's where I'm getting this data from, they were not all super virulent, horrible rashes. They had a severity spectrum. So you could have a pretty mild case of measles, as well as a pretty holy garbanzo beans case of measles. I guess it makes sense to me in retrospect, having read that now, but it somehow in my modern brain, measles was just horrible and the end. I mean, it's not smallpox, it's not the plague, but ew. So apparently you could have, just like with cases of chickenpox, you could have a fairly easygoing time of it. You could also have a fairly harsh time of it. Measles was the same way. So you'll hear about a, a good sort of measles, and that just means the, the lightweight case. Hard rooms. We learned this in Northanger Abbey. Anytime you have a dance during Jane Austen's era, this is not true for all times immemorial, but for the Regency era in particular, if one was going to be going to a dance, one would expect there to be a card room set aside for people who didn't want to or couldn't dance. So often it's men, older men, men who are not shopping for a wife. But there were other other people who just needed to go and be able to chill out and not be in the middle of all of the everything. So card rooms would have been an expected part of it. The other thing that was an expected part of a dance was dinner. And not just dinner, but a sit-down dinner. Because the Earl of Sandwich, John Montague, fourth Earl of Sandwich, who lived from 1718 to 1792, he loved playing cards so much that he was loath to get up from the table and go sit at dinner. So he's the one who requested that slices of cold meat between two pieces of bread would be brought to him so he could just continue playing. I don't know what he did about a privy, but at least food-wise, he was able to do it all at the table. But because of that, the thought of having sandwiches at a dance instead of an actual dinner dinner at a dance was kind of beyond the pale. That was just, it's just not done. It's a thing we do not do. You're going to hear something was scouted as a wretched suggestion. Scouted in this case means rejected. Going, no, no, no. -uh. And you're also going to hear, it's kind of a clever aside it's it's an easter egg that you don't need to know what's going on but it's fun if you do we've talked before about mary wollstonecraft's vindication of rights of women she also wrote about oh, vindications of the rights of men and both of those were responses to edmund burke's reflection on the revolution in france so we've heard vindication of the rights of women on craft lit before 
there is a sentence coming up. A private dance without sitting down to supper was pronounced an infamous fraud upon the rights of men and women. So, you know, at some point, I just need to do the vindication of the rights of women. Maybe we'll do that in between Emma and our next book. We'll do a little palate cleanser, a little aperitif. I think that's a essay whose time has come. Yeah, I like that. Don't let me forget. I was going to do that because I will forget. It's what I do these days. So yes, that was just a, a joke on vindication of the rights of women. Oh, Jane. There's a, a situation that I'm sure we have all experienced that as soon as you get over one hurdle, it feels like then there's a new hurdle that I have to deal with now. So you're never really out of the woods. In this case, that feeling is phrased as the removal of one solicitude. The removal of one thing that's making you anxious is just followed on by something completely new. And oh, great. That's marvelous. Thank you. In our last chapter today, you'll hear Emma talking about sitting and working. And what she is talking about is needlework. So that's, it may ring kind of odd, like, wait, you're working? What? Needleworking is what she's, she's referring to. And it will make a lot of sense when, when we get there that that's what she's doing. There's quite a bit of good Emma wisdom in our chapters today, which is why I'm excited to talk to you about these chapters on the flip side. You're going to hear about a person's letter that they sent and that compressed into the very lowest vacant corner. And this is referring to how we've talked about, uh, especially Jane Austen and Cassandra used to write all different directions on sheets of paper because paper was expensive. And so you'd cram as much as you could into all the available real estate. So the very lowest vacant corner would be like the last possible clear space that you had available and you just, you're going to cram that sucker in there one way or another. And that is it. That's everything I needed to prep for you, I think. I hope. Let's listen to Jane Austen's Emma, chapters 29, 30, and 31, or volume two, chapter 11, 12, and 13. If you are listening to your own version of Emma, please fast wind to one hour and four minutes. All right, here we go. Volume 2, Chapter 11 It may be possible to do without dancing entirely. Instances have been known of young people passing many, many months successively, without being at any ball of any description, and no material injury accrue either to body or mind. But when a beginning is made, when the felicities of rapid motion have once been, though slightly felt, it must be a very heavy set that does not ask for more. Frank Churchill had danced once at Highbury, and longed to dance again, and the last half-hour of an evening which Mr. Woodhouse was persuaded to spend with his daughter at Randall's was passed by the two young people in schemes on the subject. Frank's was the first idea, and his the greatest zeal in pursuing it— for the lady was the best judge of the difficulties, and the most solicitous for accommodation and appearance. But still she had inclination enough for showing people again how delightfully Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Woodhouse danced, for doing that in which she need not blush to compare herself with Jane Fairfax, and even for simple dancing itself without any of the wicked aids of vanity, to assist him first in pacing out the room where they were in to see what it could be made to hold, and then in taking the dimensions of the other parlour in the hope of discovering, in spite of all that Mr. Weston could say of their exactly equal size, that it was a little the largest. His first proposition and request, that the dance begun at Mr. Cole's should be finished there, that the same party should be collected and the same musician engaged, met with the readiest acquiescence— Mr. Weston entered into the idea with thorough enjoyment, and Mrs. Weston most willingly undertook to play as long as they could wish to dance, and the interesting employment had followed, of reckoning up exactly who there would be, and apportioning out the indispensable division of space to every couple. "'You and Miss Smith and Miss Fairfax will be three, and the two Miss Coxes five, had been repeated many times over. "'And there will be the two Gilberts, young Cox, my father and myself, besides Mr. Knightley. "'Yes, that will be quite enough for pleasure. "'You and Miss Smith and Miss Fairfax will be three, and the two Miss Cox is five, "'and for five couple there will be plenty of room.' "'But soon it came to be on one side. "'But will there be good room for five couple? "'I really do not think there will.' "'On another. 
and after all five couple are not enough to make it worth while to stand up. Five couple are nothing, when one thinks seriously about it. It will not do to invite five couple. It can be allowable only as the thought of the moment. Somebody said that Miss Gilbert was expected at her brother's and must be invited with the rest. Somebody else believed Mrs. Gilbert would have danced the other evening if she had been asked. A word was put in for a second young Cox, and at last Mr. Weston naming one family of cousins who must be included, and another of very old acquaintance who could not be left out, it became a certainty that the five couple would be at least ten, and a very interesting speculation in what possible manner they could be disposed of. The doors of the two rooms were just opposite each other. Might not they use both rooms, and dance across the passage? It seemed the best scheme, and yet it was not so good but that many of them wanted a better. Emma said it would be awkward, Mrs. Weston was in distress about the supper, and Mr. Woodhouse opposed it earnestly on the score of health. It made him so very unhappy, indeed, that it could not be persevered in. "'No, no,' said he, "'it would be the extreme of imprudence. I could not bear it for Emma. Emma is not strong. She would catch a dreadful cold. So would poor little Harriet. So would you all. Mrs. Weston, you would be quite laid up. Do not let them talk of such a wild thing. Pray do not let them talk of it. That young man, speaking lower, is very thoughtless. Do not tell his father, but that young man is not quite the thing. He has been opening the doors very often this evening, and keeping them open very inconsiderately. He does not think of the draught. I do not mean to set you against him, but indeed he is not quite the thing. Mrs. Weston was sorry for such a charge. She knew the importance of it, and said everything in her power to do it away. Every door was now closed, the passage plan given up, and the first scheme of dancing only in the room they were in resorted to again, and with such good will on Frank Churchill's part, that the space which a quarter of an hour before had been deemed barely sufficient for five couple, was now endeavoured to be made out quite enough for ten. "'We were too magnificent,' said he. "'We allowed unnecessary room. Ten couple may stand here very well.' Emma demurred. It would be a crowd, a sad crowd, and what could be worse than dancing without space to turn in? Very true, he gravely replied. It was very bad. But still he went on measuring, and still he ended with, I think there will be very tolerable room for ten couple. No, no, said she. You are quite unreasonable. It would be dreadful to be standing so close. Nothing can be farther from pleasure than to be dancing in a crowd, and a crowd in a little room. "'There is no denying it,' he replied. "'I agree with you exactly. A crowd and little room. Miss Woodhouse, you have the art of giving pictures in a few words. Exquisite, quite exquisite. Still, however, having proceeded so far, one is unwilling to give the matter up. It would be a disappointment to my father. And altogether, I do not know that. I am rather of opinion that ten couple might stand here very well.' Emma perceived that the nature of his gallantry was a little self-willed, and that he would rather oppose than lose the pleasure of dancing with her, but she took the compliment and forgave the rest. Had she ever intended to marry him, it might have been worth while to pause and consider, and try to understand the value of his preference and the character of his temper, but for all the purposes of their acquaintance he was quite amiable enough. Before the middle of the next day he was at Hartfield, and he entered the room with such an agreeable smile as certified the continuance of the scheme. It soon appeared that he came to announce an improvement. "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' he almost immediately began, "'your inclination for dancing has not been quite frightened away, I hope, by the terrors of my father's little rooms. I bring a new proposal on that subject, a thought of my father's which waits only your approbation to be acted upon.' May I hope for the honour of your hand for the first two dances of this little projected ball, to be given, not at Randall's, but at the Crown Inn? The Crown? Yes, and if you and Mr. Woodhouse see no objection, and I trust you cannot, my father hopes his friends will be so kind as to visit him there. Better accommodations he can promise them, and not a less grateful welcome than at Randall's. It is his own idea. Mrs. Weston sees no objection in it, provided you are satisfied. This is what we all feel. Oh, you were perfectly right. Ten couple in either of the Randalls' rooms would have been insufferable, dreadful. I felt how right you were the whole time, but was too anxious for securing anything to like to yield. Is it not a good exchange? 
You consent. I hope you consent. It appears to me a plan that nobody can object to, if Mr. and Mrs. Weston do not. I think it admirable, and as far as I can answer for myself, shall be most happy. It seems the only improvement that could be. Papa, do you not think it an excellent improvement? She was obliged to repeat and explain it, before it was fully comprehended, and then, being quite new, farther representations were necessary to make it acceptable. No, he thought it very far from an improvement, a very bad plan, much worse than the other. A room at an inn was always damp and dangerous, never properly aired or fit to be inhabited. If they must dance, they had better dance at Randall's. He had never been in the room at the Crown in his life, did not know the people who kept it by sight. Oh, no, a very bad plan. They would catch worse colds at the Crown than anywhere." "'I was going to observe, sir,' said Frank Churchill, "'that one of the great recommendations of this change would be the very little danger of anybody's catching cold, so much less danger at the Crown than at Randall's. Mr. Perry might have reason to regret the alteration, but nobody else could.' "'Sir,' said Mr. Woodhouse, rather warmly, "'you are very much mistaken if you suppose Mr. Perry to be that sort of character. Mr. Perry is extremely concerned when any of us are ill.' but I do not understand how the room at the Crown can be safer for you than your father's house. From the very circumstance of its being larger, sir, we shall have no occasion to open the windows at all, not once the whole evening, and it is that dreadful habit of opening the windows, letting in cold air upon heated bodies, which, as you well know, sir, does the mischief. Open the windows? But surely, Mr. Churchill, nobody would think of opening the windows at Randall's. Nobody could be so imprudent— I never heard of such a thing, dancing with open windows. I am sure neither your father nor Mrs. Weston, poor Miss Taylor that was, would suffer it. Ah, sir, but a thoughtless young person will sometimes step behind a window curtain and throw up a sash, without its being suspected. I have often known it done myself. Have you indeed, sir? Bless me! I never could have supposed it. But I live out of the world, and am often astonished at what I hear— However, this does make a difference, and perhaps when we come to talk it over. But these sort of things require a good deal of consideration. One cannot resolve upon them in a hurry. If Mr. and Mrs. Weston will be so obliging as to call here one morning, we may talk it over and see what can be done. But unfortunately, sir, my time is so limited. Oh, interrupted Emma, there will be plenty of time for talking everything over. There is no hurry at all. If it can be contrived to be at the Crown, papa, it will be very convenient for the horses. They will be so near their own stable. And so they will, my dear. That is a great thing. Not that James ever complains, but it is right to spare our horses when we can. If I could be sure of the rooms being thoroughly aired. But is Mrs. Stokes to be trusted? I doubt it. I do not know her, even by sight. I can answer for everything of that nature, sir, because it will be under Mrs. Weston's care. Mrs. Weston undertakes to direct the whole. There, papa, now you must be satisfied. Our own dear Mrs. Weston, who is carefulness itself. Do not you remember what Mr. Perry said so many years ago when I had the measles? If Miss Taylor undertakes to wrap Miss Emma up, you need not have any fears, sir. How often have I heard you speak of it as such a compliment to her?' "'Aye, very true. Mr. Perry did say so. I shall never forget it. Poor little Emma, you were very bad with the measles. That is, you would have been very bad, but for Perry's great attention. He came four times a day for a week. He said from the first it was a very good sort, which was our great comfort. But the measles are a dreadful complaint.' I hope whenever poor Isabella's little ones have the measles, she will send for Perry. My father and Mrs. Weston are at the Crown at this moment, said Frank Churchill, examining the capabilities of the house. I left them there and came on to Hartfield, impatient for your opinion, and hoping you might be persuaded to join them and give your advice on the spot. I was desired to say so from both. It would be the greatest pleasure to them if you could allow me to attend you there. They can do nothing satisfactorily without you. Emma was most happy to be called to such a council, and her father engaging to think it all over while she was gone, the two young people set off together without delay for the crown. 
There were Mr. and Mrs. Weston, delighted to see her and receive her approbation, very busy and very happy in their different way, she in some little distress, and he finding everything perfect. "'Emma,' said she, "'this paper is worse than I expected. Look, in places you see it is dreadfully dirty, and the wainscot is more yellow and forlorn than anything I could have imagined.' "'My dear, you are too particular,' said her husband. "'What does all that signify? You will see nothing of it by candlelight. It will be as clean as Randall's by candlelight. We never see anything of it on our club nights.' The ladies here probably exchanged looks which meant, "'Men never know when things are dirty or not,' and the gentleman perhaps thought each to himself, "'Women will have their little nonsenses and needless cares.' One perplexity, however, arose which the gentleman did not disdain. It regarded a supper-room. At the time of the ballroom's being built, suppers had not been in question, and a small card-room adjoining was the only addition. What was to be done? This card-room would be wanted as a card-room now, or, if cards were conveniently voted unnecessary by their four selves, still was it not too small for any comfortable supper? Another room of much better size might be secured for the purpose, but it was at the other end of the house, and a long, awkward passage must be gone through to get at it. This made a difficulty. Mrs. Weston was afraid of drafts for the young people in that passage, and neither Emma nor the gentleman could tolerate the prospect of being miserably crowded at supper. Mrs. Weston proposed having no regular supper, merely sandwiches, etc., set out in the little room but that was scouted as a wretched suggestion. A private dance without sitting down to supper was pronounced an infamous fraud upon the rights of men and women, and Mrs. Weston must not speak of it again. She then took another line of expediency, and looking into the doubtful room observed, "'I do not think it is so very small. We shall not be many, you know.' And Mr. Weston, at the same time, walking briskly with long steps through the passage, was calling out, "'You talk a great deal of the length of this passage, my dear. It is a mere nothing, after all, and not the least draught from the stairs.' "'I wish,' said Mrs. Weston, "'one could know which arrangement our guests in general would like best. To do what would be most generally pleasing must be our object. If one could but tell what that would be.' "'Yes, very true,' cried Frank. "'Very true. You want your neighbour's opinions.' I do not wonder at you. If one could ascertain what the chief of them, the Coles, for instance, they are not far off. Shall I call upon them? Or Miss Bates, she is still nearer. And I do not know whether Miss Bates is not as likely to understand the inclinations of the rest of the people as anybody. I think we do want a larger council. Suppose I go and invite Miss Bates to join us. Well, if you please, said Mrs. Weston, rather hesitating, if you think she'll be of any use— "'You will get nothing to the purpose from Miss Bates,' said Emma. "'She will be all delight and gratitude, but she will tell you nothing. She will not even listen to your questions. I see no advantage in consulting Miss Bates.' "'But she is so amusing, so extremely amusing. I am very fond of hearing Miss Bates talk, and I need not bring the whole family, you know.' Here Mr. Weston joined them, and on hearing what was proposed, gave it his decided approbation. "'I do, Frank. Go and fetch Miss Bates, and let us end the matter at once. She will enjoy the scheme, I am sure, and I do not know a properer person for showing us how to do away difficulties. Fetch Miss Bates. We are growing a little too nice. She is a standing lesson of how to be happy. But fetch them both. Invite them both.' "'Both, sir? Can the old lady—' "'The old lady? No, the young lady, to be sure.' I shall think you a great blockhead, Frank, if you bring the aunt without the niece. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. I did not immediately recollect. Undoubtedly, if you wish it, I will endeavour to persuade them both. And away he ran. Long before he reappeared, attending the short, neat, brisk-moving aunt and her elegant niece, Mrs. Weston, like a sweet-tempered woman and a good wife, had examined the passage again, and found the evils of it much less than she had supposed before, indeed very trifling, and here ended the difficulties of decision. All the rest, in speculation at least, was perfectly smooth. All the minor arrangements of table and chair, lights and music, tea and supper, made themselves, or were left as mere trifles to be settled at any time between Mrs. Weston and Mrs. Stokes. Everybody invited was certainly to come. Frank had already written to Enscombe to propose staying a few days beyond his fortnight, which could not possibly be refused, and a delightful dance it was to be.
Most cordially when Miss Bates arrived did she agree that it must, as a counsellor she was not wanted, but as an approver, a much safer character, she was truly welcome. Her approbation, at once general and minute, warm and incessant, could not but please, and for another half-hour they were all walking to and fro, between the different rooms, some suggesting, some attending, and all in happy enjoyment of the future. The party did not break up without Emma's being positively secured for the first two dances by the hero of the evening, nor without her overhearing Mr. Weston whisper to his wife, "'He has asked her, my dear. That's right.' I knew he would. End of chapter 11 Volume 2, Chapter 12 One thing only was wanting to make the prospect of the ball completely satisfactory to Emma, its being fixed for a day within the granted term of Frank Churchill's stay in Surrey, for in spite of Mr. Weston's confidence, she could not think it so very impossible that the Churchills might not allow their nephew to remain a day beyond his fortnight— but this was not judged feasible. The preparations must take their time, nothing could be properly ready till the third week were entered on, and for a few days they must be planning, proceeding, and hoping in uncertainty, at the risk, in her opinion, the great risk of its being all in vain. Enscombe, however, was gracious, gracious in fact, if not in word. His wish of staying longer evidently did not please, but it was not opposed— all was safe and prosperous, and as the removal of one solicitude generally makes way for another, Emma, being now certain of her ball, began to adopt as the next vexation Mr. Knightley's provoking indifference about it, either because he did not dance himself, or because the plan had been formed without his being consulted, he seemed resolved that it should not interest him, determined against its exciting any present curiosity, or affording him any future amusement. To her voluntary communications Emma could get no more approving reply than, "'Very well. If the Westons think it worth while to be all this trouble for a few hours of noisy entertainment, I have nothing to say against it, but that they shall not choose pleasures for me. Oh, yes, I must be there. I could not refuse, and I will keep as much awake as I can. But I would rather be at home, looking over William Larkin's weak account, much rather, I confess.' pleasure in seeing dancing. Not I, indeed. I never look at it. I do not know who does. Fine dancing, I believe, like virtue, must be its own reward. Those who are standing by are usually thinking of something very different. This, Emma felt, was aimed at her, and it made her quite angry. It was not in compliment to Jane Fairfax, however, that he was so indifferent or so indignant. He was not guided by her feelings in reprobating the ball, for she enjoyed the thought of it to an extraordinary degree. It made her animated, open-hearted. She voluntarily said, "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, I hope nothing may happen to prevent the ball. What a disappointment it would be!' I do look forward to it, I own, with very great pleasure. It was not to oblige Jane Fairfax, therefore, that he would have preferred the society of William Larkins. No, she was more and more convinced that Mrs. Weston was quite mistaken in that surmise. There was a great deal of friendly and of compassionate attachment on his side, but no love. Alas, there was soon no leisure for quarrelling with Mr. Knightley. Two days of joyful security were immediately followed by the overthrow of everything. A letter arrived from Mr. Churchill to urge his nephew's instant return. Mrs. Churchill was unwell, far too unwell to do without him. She had been in a very suffering state, so said her husband, when writing to her nephew two days before, though from her usual unwillingness to give pain, and constant habit of never thinking of herself, she had not mentioned it but now she was too ill to trifle, and must entreat him to set off for Enscombe without delay. The substance of this letter was forwarded to Emma, in a note from Mrs. Weston, instantly. As to his going, it was inevitable. He must be gone within a few hours, though without feeling any real alarm for his aunt, to lessen his repugnance. He knew her illnesses. They never occurred but for her own convenience. Mrs. Weston added— that he could only allow himself time to hurry to Highbury after breakfast, and take leave of the few friends there whom he could suppose to feel any interest in him, and that he might be expected at Hartfield very soon. 
This wretched note was the finale of Emma's breakfast, when once it had been read there was no doing anything but lament and exclaim. The loss of the ball, the loss of the young man, and all that the young man might be feeling. It was too wretched. Such a delightful evening as it would have been. Everybody so happy, and she and her partner the happiest. I said it would be so, was the only consolation. Her father's feelings were quite distinct. He thought principally of Mrs. Churchill's illness, and wanted to know how she was treated, and as for the ball, it was shocking to have dear Emma disappointed, but they would all be safer at home. Emma was ready for her visitor some time before he appeared, but if this reflected at all upon his impatience, his sorrowful look and total want of spirits when he did come might redeem him. He felt the going away almost too much to speak of it. His dejection was most evident. He sat really lost in thought for the first few minutes, and when rousing himself it was only to say, "'Of all horrid things, leave-taking is the worst.' "'But you will come again,' said Emma. "'This will not be your only visit to Randalls.' "'Ah,' shaking his head, "'the uncertainty of when I may be able to return.' I shall try for it with a zeal. It will be the object of all my thoughts and cares. And if my uncle and aunt go to town this spring— But I am afraid they did not stir last spring. I am afraid it is a custom gone for ever. Our poor ball must be quite given up. Ah, that ball! Why did we wait for anything? Why not seize the pleasure at once? How often is happiness destroyed by preparation, foolish preparation? You told us it would be so. Oh, Miss Woodhouse, why are you always so right? Indeed, I am very sorry to be right in this instance. I would much rather have been merry than wise. If I can come again, we are still to have our ball. My father depends on it. Do not forget your engagement. Emma looked graciously. Such a fortnight as it has been, he continued. Every day more precious and more delightful than the day before. Every day making me less fit to bear any other place. Happy those who can remain at Highbury. As you do us such ample justice now, said Emma, laughing, I will venture to ask whether you did not come a little doubtfully at first. Do not we rather surpass your expectations? I am sure we do. I am sure you did not much expect to like us— you would not have been so long in coming if you had had a pleasant idea of Highbury. He laughed rather consciously, and though denying the sentiment, Emma was convinced that it had been so. And you must be off this very morning? Yes, my father is to join me here. We shall walk back together, and I must be off immediately. I am almost afraid that every moment will bring him. Not five minutes to spare even for your friends Miss Fairfax and Miss Bates. How unlucky! Miss Bates's powerful, argumentative mind might have strengthened yours. Yes, I have called there. Passing the door, I thought it better. It was a right thing to do. I went in for three minutes and was detained by Miss Bates's being absent. She was out, and I felt it impossible not to wait till she came in. She is a woman that one may, that one must, laugh at, but that one would not wish to slight. It was better to pay my visit then. He hesitated, got up, walked to a window. "'In short,' said he, "'perhaps, Miss Woodhouse, I think you can hardly be quite without suspicion.' He looked at her as if wanting to read her thoughts. She hardly knew what to say. It seemed like the forerunner of something absolutely serious, which she did not wish. Forcing herself to speak, therefore, in the hope of putting it by, she calmly said, "'You are quite in the right.' It was most natural to pay your visit, then. He was silent. She believed he was looking at her, probably reflecting on what she had said and trying to understand the manner. She heard him sigh. It was natural for him to feel that he had cause to sigh. He could not believe her to be encouraging him. A few awkward moments passed, and he sat down again, and in a more determined manner said, "'It was something to feel that all the rest of my time might be given to Hartfield.' My regard for Hartfield is most warm. He stopped again, rose again, and seemed quite embarrassed. He was more in love with her than Emma had supposed, and who can say how it might have ended if his father had not made his appearance? Mr. Woodhouse soon followed, and the necessity of exertion made him composed. 
A very few minutes more, however, completed the present trial. Mr. Weston, always alert when business was to be done, and as incapable of procrastinating any evil that was inevitable, as of foreseeing any that was doubtful, said, It was time to go. And the young man, though he might and did sigh, could not but agree to take leave. I shall hear about you all, said he. That is my chief consolation. I shall hear of everything that is going on among you. I have engaged Mrs. Weston to correspond with me. She has been so kind as to promise it. Oh, the blessing of a female correspondent, when one is really interested in the absent! She will tell me everything. In her letters I shall be at dear Highbury again. A very friendly shake of the hand, a very earnest good-bye, closed the speech, and the door had soon shut out Frank Churchill. Short had been the notice, short their meeting, he was gone, and Emma felt so sorry to part, and foresaw so great a loss to their little society from his absence, as to begin to be afraid of being too sorry, and feeling it too much. It was a sad change. They had been meeting almost every day since his arrival. Certainly his being at Randall's had given great spirit to the last two weeks, indescribable spirit— the idea, the expectation of seeing him which every morning had brought, the assurance of his attentions, his liveliness, his manners, it had been a very happy fortnight, and forlorn must be the sinking from it into the common course of Hartfield days. To complete every other recommendation, he had almost told her that he loved her. What strength, or what constancy of affection he might be subject to, was another point— but at present she could not doubt his having a decidedly warm admiration, a conscious preference of herself, and this persuasion, joined to all the rest, made her think that she must be a little in love with him, in spite of every previous determination against it. "'I certainly must,' said she. "'This sensation of listlessness, weariness, stupidity— this disinclination to sit down and employ myself, this feeling of everything's being dull and insipid about the house. I must be in love. I should be the oddest creature in the world if I were not, for a few weeks at least. Well, evil to some is always good to others. I shall have many fellow mourners for the ball, if not for Frank Churchill, but Mr. Knightley will be happy. He may spend the evening with his dear William Larkins now, if he likes. Mr. Knightley, however, showed no triumphant happiness. He could not say that he was sorry on his own account. His very cheerful look would have contradicted him if he had. But he said, and very steadily, that he was sorry for the disappointment of the others, and with considerable kindness added, "'You, Emma, who have so few opportunities of dancing, you are really out of luck. You are very much out of luck.' It was some days before she saw Jane Fairfax, to judge of her honest regret in this woeful change, but when they did meet, her composure was odious. She had been particularly unwell, however, suffering from headache to a degree, which made her aunt declare that had the ball taken place, she did not think Jane could have attended it, and it was charity to impute some of her unbecoming indifference to the languor of ill health. End of chapter 12 Volume 2, Chapter 13 Emma continued to entertain no doubt of her being in love. Her ideas only varied as to the how much. At first she thought it was a good deal, and afterwards but little. She had great pleasure in hearing Frank Churchill talked of, and for his sake greater pleasure than ever in seeing Mr. and Mrs. Weston. She was very often thinking of him, and quite impatient for a letter, that she might know how he was, how were his spirits, how was his aunt, and what was the chance of his coming to Randall's again this spring? But on the other hand, she could not admit herself to be unhappy, nor, after the first morning, to be less disposed for employment than usual. She was still busy and cheerful, and pleasing as he was, she could yet imagine him to have faults, and farther, though thinking of him so much, and, as she sat drawing or working, forming a thousand amusing schemes for the progress and close of their attachment— fancying interesting dialogues and inventing elegant letters, the conclusion of every imaginary declaration on his side was that she refused him. Their affection was always to subside into friendship. Everything tender and charming was to mark their parting, but still they were to part. When she became sensible of this, it struck her that she could not be very much in love, for in spite of her previous and fixed determination never to quit her father, never to marry— 
A strong attachment certainly must produce more of a struggle than she could foresee in her own feelings. "'I do not find myself making any use of the word sacrifice,' said she. "'In not one of all my clever replies, my delicate negatives, is there any allusion to making a sacrifice? I do suspect that he is not really necessary to my happiness. So much the better. I certainly will not persuade myself to feel more than I do. I am quite enough in love. I should be sorry to be more.' Upon the whole she was equally contented with her view of his feelings. He is undoubtedly very much in love, everything denotes it, very much in love indeed, and when he comes again, if his affection continue, I must be on my guard not to encourage it. It would be most inexcusable to do otherwise, as my own mind is quite made up. Not that I imagine he can think I have been encouraging him hitherto. No, if he had believed me at all to share his feelings, he would not have been so wretched— could he have thought himself encouraged, his looks and language at parting would have been different. Still, however, I must be on my guard. This is in the supposition of his attachment continuing what it now is. But I do not know that I expect it will. I do not look upon him to be quite the sort of man. I do not altogether build upon his steadiness or constancy. His feelings are warm, but I can imagine them rather changeable." every consideration of the subject, in short, makes me thankful that my happiness is not more deeply involved. I shall do very well again after a little while, and then it will be a good thing over, for they say everybody is in love once in their lives, and I shall have been let off easily. When his letter to Mrs. Weston arrived, Emma had the perusal of it, and she read it with a degree of pleasure and admiration which made her at first shake her head over her own sensations, and think she had undervalued their strength. It was a long, well-written letter, giving the particulars of his journey and of his feelings, expressing all the affection, gratitude, and respect which was natural and honourable, and describing everything exterior and local that could be supposed attractive, with spirit and precision. No suspicious flourishes now of apology or concern. It was the language of real feeling towards Mrs. Weston, and the transition from Highbury to Enscombe, the contrast between the places in some of the first blessings of social life, was just enough touched on to show how keenly it was felt, and how much more might have been said but for the restraints of propriety. The charm of her own name was not wanting. Miss Woodhouse appeared more than once, and never without a something of pleasing connection— either a compliment to her taste, or a remembrance of what she had said, and in the very last time of its meeting her eye, unadorned as it was by any such broad wreath of gallantry, she yet could discern the effect of her influence, and acknowledge the greatest compliment perhaps of all conveyed. Compressed into the very lowest vacant corner were these words. "'I had not a spare moment on Tuesday, as you know, for Miss Woodhouse's beautiful little friend. Pray make my excuses and adieus to her.' This, Emma could not doubt, was all for herself. Harriet was remembered only from being her friend. His information and prospects as to Enscombe were neither worse nor better than had been anticipated. Mrs. Churchill was recovering, and he dared not yet, even in his own imagination, fix a time for coming to Randall's again. Gratifying, however, and stimulative as was the letter in the material part, its sentiments, she yet found, when it was folded up and returned to Mrs. Weston, that it had not added any lasting warmth, that she could still do without the writer, and that he must learn to do without her. Her intentions were unchanged. Her resolution of refusal only grew more interesting by the addition of a scheme for his subsequent constellation and happiness— his recollection of Harriet, and the words which clothed it, the beautiful little friend, suggested to her the idea of Harriet succeeding her in his affections. Was it impossible? No. Harriet undoubtedly was greatly his inferior in understanding, but he had been very much struck with the loveliness of her face and the warm simplicity of her manner, and all the probabilities of circumstance and connection were in her favour. For Harriet it would be advantageous and delightful indeed. I must not dwell upon it, said she. I must not think of it. I know the danger of indulging such speculations. But stranger things have happened, and when we cease to care for each other as we do now, it will be the means of confirming us in that sort of true disinterested friendship which I can already look forward to with pleasure. It was well to have a comfort in store on Harriet's behalf, though it might be wise to let the fancy touch it seldom, for evil in that quarter was at hand. 
as Frank Churchill's arrival had succeeded Mr. Elton's engagement in the conversation of Highbury, as the latest interest had entirely borne down the first, so now, upon Frank Churchill's disappearance, Mr. Elton's concerns were assuming the most irresistible form. His wedding day was named. He would soon be among them again, Mr. Elton and his bride. There was hardly time to talk over the first letter from Enscombe before Mr. Elton and his bride was in everybody's mouth, and Frank Churchill was forgotten. Emma grew sick at the sound. She had had three weeks of happy exemption from Mr. Elton, and Harriet's mind, she had been willing to hope, had been lately gaining strength. With Mr. Weston's ball in view, at least, there had been a great deal of insensibility to other things, but it was now too evident that she had not attained such a state of composure as could stand against the actual approach, new carriage, bell ringing, and all. Poor Harriet was in a flutter of spirits which required all the reasonings and soothings and attentions of every kind that Emma could give. Emma felt that she could not do too much for her, that Harriet had a right to all her ingenuity and all her patience— but it was heavy work to be forever convincing without producing any effect, forever agreed to without being able to make their opinions the same. Harriet listened submissively and said, "'It was very true. It was just as Miss Woodhouse described. It was not worth while to think about them, and she would not think about them any longer.' But no change of subject could avail, and the next half-hour saw her as anxious and restless about the Eltons as before. At last Emma attacked her on another ground— "'Your allowing yourself to be so occupied and so unhappy about Mr. Elton's marrying, Harriet, is the strongest reproach you can make me. You could not give me a greater reproof for the mistake I fell into. It was all my doing, I know. I have not forgotten it, I assure you. Deceived myself, I did very miserably deceive you. And it will be a painful reflection to me for ever. Do not imagine me in danger of forgetting it.' Harriet felt this too much to utter more than a few words of eager exclamation. Emma continued. I have not said exert yourself, Harriet, for my sake. Think less, talk less of Mr. Elton for my sake, because for your own sake, rather, I would wish it to be done, for the sake of what is more important than my comfort, a habit of self-command in you, a consideration of what is your duty, an attention to propriety, an endeavour to avoid the suspicions of others, to save your health and credit, and restore your tranquillity. These are the motives which I have been pressing on you— they are very important, and sorry I am that you cannot feel them sufficiently to act upon them. My being saved from pain is a very secondary consideration. I want you to save yourself from greater pain. Perhaps I may sometimes have felt that Harriet would not forget what was due, or rather what would be kind by me. This appeal to her affections did more than all the rest. The idea of wanting gratitude and consideration for Miss Woodhouse, whom she really loved extremely, made her wretched for a while, and when the violence of grief was comforted away, still remained powerful enough to prompt to what was right and support her in it very tolerably. "'You, who have been the best friend I ever had in my life, want gratitude to you. Nobody is equal to you. I care for nobody as I do for you.' "'Oh, Miss Woodhouse, how ungrateful I have been!' Such expressions, assisted as they were by everything that look and manner could do, made Emma feel that she had never loved Harriet so well, nor valued her affection so highly before. "'There is no charm equal to tenderness of heart,' said she afterwards to herself. "'There is nothing to be compared to it. Warmth and tenderness of heart, with an affectionate open manner, will beat all the clearness of head in the world for attraction. I am sure it will. It is tenderness of heart which makes my dear father so generally beloved, which gives Isabella all her popularity. I have it not, but I know how to prize and respect it. Harriet is my superior in all the charm and all the felicity it gives. Dear Harriet!' I would not change you for the clearest-headed, longest-sighted, best-judging female breathing. Oh, the coldness of a Jane Fairfax! Harriet is worth a hundred such. And for a wife, a sensible man's wife, it is invaluable. I mention no names, but happy the man who changes Emma for Harriet. End of chapter 13 So Emma's gone through a bit in these these chapters. And I mentioned before that there's been some interesting Emma wisdom. Some of it is overtly drawn out for us, and some of it I thought was more subtextual. 
And so I wanted to make sure that none of it got got missed or or lost in the in the larger shuffle. Some of that goes back to how Emma is well aware that Jane Fairfax is better at her in some things than others. So when she's talking about dancing, she says she need not blush to compare herself with Jane Fairfax when it comes to dancing. She didn't have to be embarrassed about her dancing technique and style. And that even for simple dancing itself without any of the wicked aids of vanity, she knew that it was safe for her to to think, no, I'm I'm actually a pretty good dancer. I love that wicked aids of vanity. That feels more Jane than Emma, but I hope it's also Emma. I thought the word construction of five couple, ten couple was interesting, like five pair of pants instead of five pairs of pants. It's not not said, it's just not frequently said, and I'd never really heard it said this way about human people instead of inanimate objects. So I thought that was fun. I also thought as much as we get interesting intel on Emma character-wise, we also get some important stuff about Frank. And he he drops it several different times throughout our chapters today, this idea that planning, inviting, planning ahead robs you of some of the fun. And we've definitely seen that in Mr. West, and we saw it already in Frank, the, I'm just going to show up early because, darn it, let's let the fun begin right away. And Mr. West is definitely of the mind, like anything that could be off-putting to your friends about you showing up early will be offset by the fact that everybody's so happy to see each other and we're going to have a good time, which is true, but also very stressful for the person who's being visited. In this case, Frank several different times talks about the planning not being so great. And point of fact, he's not very good at planning. He's not good at listening to what other people are saying about the the limitations. And he's being thoughtless. He's leaving all the doors open at Hartfield. And he's he's making poor Mr. Woodhouse very unhappy. And of course, Mr. Woodhouse is all, but Emma's not strong. She's weak. She'll catch a cold. No, no, Harriet's so little. She's going to get sick. Oh, no, this is a bad idea. Bad idea. All the way around. And then Emma, Emma's like, we are not going to be able to fit 10 couples of people in here. That's 20 people. They will not all fit. There will not be enough room to turn around. And then Frank's like, yes, absolutely very true. But he keeps measuring. And then I agree with you exactly. There's no denying it. it. The room is too small. I agree with you exactly. However, I'm very much of the opinion that 10 couple would fit just fine. I love what comes after coming from Emma. She perceived the nature of his gallantry was a little self-willed and that he would rather oppose than lose the pleasure of dancing with her. She took the compliment that he really wants to dance with her, and that's why he's pushing like this, and forgave the rest. And at first I was like, oh, Emma, that's just, you know, you're getting these semaphore signals from the universe going, not a good match. But then the next line is, had she intended to marry him, it might have been worthwhile to pause and consider, to try and understand the value of his preference and the character of his temper. But for all the purposes of their acquaintance, he was quite amiable enough. Really good advice for young women, the the kind of trust your gut thing. And young men, honestly, good looking, flashy people. Don't just pay attention to how they look and how they sound. Pay attention to what they actually are saying and what they're actually doing. And that can save save you from some heartache. So we've talked a lot over the years about attitudes and belief systems surrounding illness. And one of the annotations in the book actually gives us some quoted material from Edinburgh. So definitely from a medical thing. It's the Code of Health and Longevity, first edition, volume three. And this is all dealing with the, oh, you know, overheated bodies and cold air and who would open a window? Why would you open a window at a dance? Oh my goodness, Mr. Woodhouse is freaking out. So this is a, a man named John Sinclair. And he says in this code of health, after hot bathing or hard labor, when the body is in a sweat, by no means leave off any of your clothes nor expose yourself to fresh air. So don't like undo your shirt and get some fresh air circulating. 
for this light refreshment of getting the fresh air in may cost you dear. The cold air closes the pores, and thence comes a gathering of ill humors, which would have found vent this way, either by sensible sweat or insensible perspiration, especially at the feet, the back, and the belly, which should not feel the cold. And at first I was like, wow, that's weird, the belly. And then I thought, no, actually, that makes a lot of sense because that's, that's you know, if you're going to huddle in and shiver up, that's really your core is what you are protecting is that whole, not just your belly, but your chest and lungs and all of the parts of your body that you need to keep working all the time because your brain can't work without them. So I thought that was nice to finally get some kind of actual quotationalizing from a trusted source of the time that came out in uh, 1807. So it was definitely timely for us. I also thought this was another one of those Frank Churchill moments where in trying to convince Mr. Woodhouse, no, 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 it's it's going to be fine because we'll we'll do it at this place and it'll be big enough and we won't have to open any windows. Mr. Woodhouse starts to freak out. Who would think to do that? And Frank's like, oh, well, a thoughtless young person will sometimes step behind a window curtain and throw up a, th throw up a sash without its being suspected. I have often known it done myself. I think what Frank meant to say or was saying inside his head was, I have often done it myself, Frank. Hmm. Hmm. So both owning up as the thoughtless guy, but also trying to get across the point that it's a real thing. People are going to do that. I would be one who would go and open a window is what I would do. But I certainly wouldn't bring it up in front of Mr. Woodhouse. I also love that Emma, in trying to get the crown to be approved by her father, has to, again, come back to the horses and James. Well, the horses will be much happier because they'll be so close to their own stable. It's not like they're going to be at home. They still have to get hooked up. James is going to have to drive them. All of that, but they'll be close to home. Not as far away as if we went to Randall. And that works. I also thought it was interesting that Mr. Woodhouse is not entirely sure about the crown because of Mrs. Stokes, the proprietress, is she to be trusted to air out the rooms and make sure that everything is fine, no ill air in the place? I doubt it. I do not know her even by sight. Again, just a reminder that Highbury is, people have been in Highbury for a long time. It is an old, small village and everybody knows everybody else. And apparently Mrs. Stokes is new enough, which probably means 30 years. Mr. Woodhouse doesn't know her, even, even to see. So one of the things about the card room being attached to the dance space is the line that comes before that, at the time of the ballrooms being built, suppers had not been in question. So by this time, the dinner being expected with the dancing was a done thing. In a prior generation, not so much. And at that point, Sandwiches would have been fine, but it's just another indication that if Highbury was populous and societally driven enough to have a place where a ballroom had been built, we now know that it was that that heyday was in fact a oh, considerable amount of time ago, because the idea of dinner being connected to to the dancing didn't really show up until the very end of the 18th century, so the 1790s. So we, we can at least date it that much. I thought the way Mr. Weston described Miss Bates was lovely. I don't know a, a proper person for showing us how to do away with difficulties. We are growing a little too nice. She is a standing lesson of how to be happy. He can be annoying, but he also is just love. He's just full of love and he, he sees the good in everybody and sees merit and usefulness in people that might get overlooked or missed. Frank also seems to like Miss Bates quite a bit. I have a theory, but I'm not going to share that theory with you until we get further into the book. I also love that Mr. Weston's response to Frank when he's like, what, I should go bring the Mrs. Bates with Miss Bates? I should think you're a great blockhead, Frank, if you bring the aunt without the niece. No, he's talking about Jane Fairfax. Bring Jane if you're going to bring Miss Bates. Oh, oh, perhaps he is a great blockhead. 
I love, again, the Austinian style of Emma reporting to us about how Mr. Knightley responds to having the dance. He's not interested. He couldn't care less. Oh, yes, I must be there. Semicolon. I could not refuse. Semicolon. And I will keep as much awake as I can. Semicolon. But I would rather be at home looking over William Larkins's weekly account. Semicolon. Much rather, I confess. And the pleasure in seeing dancing, not I, indeed, I never look at it. I don't know who does. Fine dancing, I believe, like a virtue, must be its own reward. And this actually goes back to Seneca, to the Latin. And I've seen it written, Latin can go in different word orders, so I've seen it written two different ways. Ipsa virtus pritium sui, virtus ipsa pritium sui. Either way, it is virtue itself is worth the price. It's a Stoic philosophy that doing the right, doing the virtuous thing, that's enough. It's enough just to be a good person. You don't have to feel magnanimous about it. Just be a good person. That's a good life. You have a lot less stress if you just make cautious, thoughtful, good decisions. Heather says to herself to remind her to do that more often. I also loved that when Frank gets the letter from Anscombe, he's got Mr. Churchill wrote the letter saying that Mrs. Churchill was far too unwell to do without Frank. She'd been in a very suffering state, so said her husband when writing to her nephew two days before, though from her usual unwillingness to give pain, ha, and constant habit of never thinking of herself, ha, ha, she'd not mentioned it. But now she was too sick, too sick. And so the husband had to write and demand that Frank come home early. Meh. Meh, I say. Nee. So the, the Emma wisdom that I had alluded to at the beginning today, it's this last chapter that I really thought was very interesting. Because at first she's like, oh, I miss him, I miss him, I miss him, I must be in love. And then she stops and she's thinking more about that whole being in love thing. And when she gets to the, the I do not find myself making any use of the word sacrifice. It is not one of all my clever replies, you know, thinking over what would I say if he had had a chance to say he loved me? What would I have responded with? What would have happened if we had had the dance? What, what might we have said to each other then? It is not in any of my clever replies, my delicate negatives, the I can't marry you because daddy. Nowhere in there is there any allusion to making a sacrifice. I do suspect that he's not really necessary to my happiness. That's so important. That is so important. And then I certainly will not persuade myself to feel more than I do. This is a very non silly statement. This is not Harriet. This is not somebody who's in love with the idea of being in love. I will not persuade myself to feel more than I do. I am quite enough in love. This much in loveness is just fine. I should be sorry to be more. Ah. And then, and then what kind of blows that all out of the water is the very next line. And it is just a single line paragraph. Upon the whole, she was equally contented with her view of his feelings. And then the new paragraph starts. He is undoubtedly in love with me, which I'm sure makes it a lot easier to walk away from this and say, no, it's fine. I, I don't need, he can need me. That's peachy, but I'm, I'm not going to work myself up into a fit over him. I also thought it was very smart. Um, it makes me very thankful that my happiness is not more deeply involved because Frank, she's recognizing some of Frank's faults that she, she had noticed back when they were planning out the, the dance hall. I should do very well again after a little while, and then it will be a good thing over. For they say everybody is in love once in their lives, and I shall have been let off easily. If this is the worst disappointment she's going to have in relationships, then she's winning big time. Very, very smart and wise. I also thought that Frank's letter was interesting, the one that he sent to Mrs. Weston, and that Frank knew that Mrs. Weston was going to be bringing the letters to Emma to read as well. So 
when he's commenting on how dull Enscom is compared to Highbury, that's partially for his father and his stepmother, but also I have a feeling really honest. It's like Emma's been very cloistered in Highbury, but it feels like some of Frank's kind of rabid pursuit of the dance, some of it was just caprice. But some of it also could be that he's just as cloistered in his life up north as Emma has been down south. I love that in the letter, the charm of her own name was not wanting. It's like he mentions her by name. That's lovely. He doesn't mention Harriet by name. He says Emma's beautiful little friend, which could only be Harriet. And then Emma found that when she'd folded, you know, read the letter, folded it back up, handed it over to Mrs. Weston, it had not added any lasting warmth. And she could still do without the writer, and that he must learn to do without her. But then, oh dear, almost immediately, she starts thinking of Frank having mentioned Harriet being a beautiful little friend. And ooh, maybe they'd be a good couple. And huh. If that gets Harriet off the topic of Mr. Elton, that might not be a bad thing either. And she's right back at it, although not nearly as fast and furious as she was with Mr. Elton. I also thought that Emma's final attempt to get Harriet to stop bemoaning Mr. Elton was interesting. She's tried everything else. She's tried logic. She's tried distracting her. And finally, she says, it's really making me feel bad about well, me and my behavior. But the way I was reading it, I don't get the sense that it's quite so superficial and selfish on Emma's part. It's almost like one of the things with ADHD brains is that it's very, very hard to admit fault or lacking of anything out into the world in public because you are already feeling the shame so, so tremendously and deeply yourself that exposing that exposing those feelings exposing the the truth of those flaws and therefore making them very very real is horrifying and incredibly painful and that's some of what i was sensing going on here it's like it's i get it trust me i feel worse about the mr elton thing than you possibly could because I know it was my fault and I feel guilt about it every day. Whether you're saying it or not, I am feeling it. And that's the thing that's interesting is the Emma did start feeling really, really bad about Mr. Elton as soon as they had the carriage ride together. She didn't have to wait to see Harriet's face to start feeling bad. So I, I really do kind of buy that, that Emma's being honest here. Like I really, I can't keep hearing how badly I ruined your life. I know how badly I ruined your life. I'm doing everything I can to make up for it right now. And of course, Harriet's response was just lovely. You've been the best friend. Nobody's equal to you. I care for nobody. I mean, that's very sweet and all. But again, Emma, just like with the Jane Fairfax thing, Emma's, Emma's aware of the reality of the situation. And I give her props for that. Not everybody can be that honest about themselves. And she is certainly getting better. She has been progressively getting better throughout the course of the book, and she'll continue to as well. So that is the end of our chapters for today. Next week, we will get to see Mr. Elton's wife. It's very exciting. Don't forget to sign up on the widget to Rafflecopter to be put into the running for one of the two lovely little coaster bookmark sets. Don't forget to sign up for our Christmas in July bookmark exchange for 2024 for people who are not listening in real time or even in the same year. The cutoff for signups is July 19th, 2024. And the sending date is August 6th, 2024. I know stuff like podcasts lasts a long time. So if I don't put the year on there, I have the possibility of confusing people quite a bit. And Eric has done a fabulous thing for you. Over on Patreon, the following books have been added to the premium feed for your listening pleasure. Those books are Bleak House, Wuthering Heights, 
and the Sherlock Holmes stories that we did with John Scholes. So, Patreon now has even more premium books available to you. I hope you enjoy. All right, you have a great week. I am going to go lie down and I will see you soon. Take care of yourself. Have a great one. Talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.